Welcome to Earth for Science the Big Questions. I'm your host, Rachel Funnell, and today I'm at the London Natural History Museum for a very exciting episode where we're looking back on 30 years of Jurassic Park. I'm here to speak to dinosaur expert Dr. Susie Maiden about what we've learned in the last three decades, and I'll also be speaking to Ben Lamb, CEO and co-founder of Colossal, about whether or not we could ever actually clone a dinosaur. So hello, Dr. Susie Maidman. It's great to see you again. Hi there. Thanks for coming down to the Dinosaur Collections. It's excellent to be here. And we're standing here in 2023. So that means somehow 30 years have passed since the Jurassic Park film came out. No idea where they've gone. But in that time, you know, science has trundled on and we've made some incredible discoveries. So what do we know so far about the possibility of bringing dinosaurs back? Well, people have had some ideas about how we might be able to bring dinosaurs back. And of course, um, the first one in Jurassic Park was the idea that we could maybe extract some blood uh, from a mosquito um, and then uh, take the DNA uh, from that, uh, fill in the gaps in the DNA um, and then clone a dinosaur. Um, well, we can't do that, and um, we still can't do that 30 years on from the film. Uh, and that's because um, we haven't found any DNA from dinosaurs. And in fact, the oldest DNA in the fossil record is, is probably only around a million years old, maybe a bit more. So th the dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago. So definitely we don't have any DNA for dinosaurs at this point. We do, however, now have some blood. Um, so we have some red blood cells that are preserved from dinosaurs um, and some other soft tissue features. So maybe in the future, we might be able to get some DNA. Um, there are a couple of other different techniques that are going on though. Um, one of those is reverse engineering. So this is this idea that you can maybe take a bird, which of course are the direct descendants of the dinosaurs, fiddle around with its genetics and produce something like a dinosaur. Fantastic. And so in the film, obviously, when you're talking about the, the precious dino DNA there, they use a mosquito trapped in amber. So would that not work for our understanding of fossils at the moment? Yeah, so when we look at uh, insects in amber, what we tend to find is that um, the, the, the outside of the insect, the kind of chitinous husk, um, the crunchy bit, if you like, of the insect, <laughs> um, but the inside stuff isn't preserved. So there isn't any blood uh, found within those. But there has been a, a beautiful uh, specimen of a mosquito found preserved in lake sediments. So these are very, very, very kind of finely laminated, finely layered sediments. Um, and this specimen had a kind of dark stain around its abdomen. Um, and when they tested that, they actually found the breakdown products of haemoglobin in it. So it was blood in a mosquito's ab abdomen. However, that specimen was actually only 60 million years old, so not old enough to be around at the same time as the dinosaurs. Fantastic. So massive gap then between then and where we're at now. And in the film, when they manage to extract their DNA from the amber specimen, they get this genome, but it's not quite complete. So their idea is, well, we'll just get a bit of a frog and we'll plug in the gaps. Is there any reason that might work? Or what would be the flaws there? Yeah, so there are, there are some major, fairly major flaws uh, with this whole kind of concept. I mean, firstly, in order to know where the gaps in the DNA are, you kind of have to have the whole genome to start off with, otherwise you don't know which bits are missing. Um, and the second problem is that frogs, I mean, frogs, frogs are like, they're the least likely organism you'd choose. I mean, the, the organism that you would choose would be birds, because birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs. And when Jurassic Park came out, um, I don't think that was 100% accepted. Like, there were some ideas that that might be the case, but it wasn't as widely as accepted as it is now. Now that's just fact, basically. Um, but, but we still, they still wouldn't have used frog. I mean, humans are more closely related to dinosaurs than frogs are. So, so it, it, it was totally a bizarre choice, but <laughs> it was needed for the narrative of the film because they needed the dinosaurs to be able to uh, change sex randomly uh, and then you know, produce offspring. Um, and so they needed this, and this is something that frogs, some frogs can do, so yeah. And for entertainment value, it really paid off. So <laughs> fair enough, Michael, we got it. The animal cloning aspect of Jurassic Park is actually a field of science our second guest, Ben Lamb over at Colossal, is something of an expert in, where he works towards the de-extinction of animals that aren't around today, like the woolly mammoth. So Colossal Biosciences, to our knowledge at least, is the world's first de-extinction company and species preservation company. And what that means to us is looking and understanding what are the genes associated with the core phenotypes or physical attributes that existed in an extinct animal. So, for example, with the woolly mammoth, that's like the dome cranium, that's the curved tusk, uh, that's making it cold tolerant to a lot of things kind of under the hood. Uh, things, you know, like how nerve endings respond to negative 40, how your 
how the body produces hemoglobin and oxygen there, and then obviously the shaggy wool coat. And so how can we at Colossal understand the core genes uh, that, that made elephants cold tolerant uh, that are that are that those genes are now extinct and then how do we then ex uh, how do we then de-extinct those genes and put them into the architecture if you will of an existing living animal in the, the case of the mammoth the uh the asian elephant which is 99.6 percent the same genetically um and then and then and then you know de-extinct those genes so that you then have kind of like the mammoth 2.0 Fantastic. And so you mentioned the mammoth there, but as I understand it, your company works with a few animals. So you could tell me what else you're working with? Yeah, so we're working on, uh, obviously, the woolly mammoth. We're working on the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, uh, and then uh, the iconic dodo uh, from Mauritius. Amazing. And uh, when you're looking to do these projects with these different animals, what kind of materials do you need to begin with to bring them back? Yeah, so first you need to look at like what is the closest phylogenetic relative? What is the what is the animal that's still existing on the planet that's the closest on the family tree? So in examples like for the for the woolly mammoth, that's the Asian elephant. As I mentioned, it's 99.6% the same genetically. It's actually it, most people don't realize this, but an Asian elephant's actually closer genetically on the family tree to a woolly mammoth than it even is an African elephant. And sometimes that fact blows people's mind, right? Because they're like, well, mammoths aren't here anymore. These two are still here. And so you've got to find and build a reference genome. So you got to get tissue samples. You got to be re build a reference genome. Uh, we did that last year with the Asian elephant. Uh, we just announced this week uh, the uh, African elephant reference genome that we built uh, for comparative genomics. And then you've got to get tissue samples uh, in, in, in ancient DNA from those extinct species. And ancient DNA is very different than existing, you know, living DNA because it's massively fragmented. It's not at all exogenous, meaning that, that there's other like microbes or other things that kind of contaminate, contaminate, uh, contaminated over time. Uh, and then, uh, and then you've got to basically piece together that. So like with the mammoth, we actually use 54 different mammoth genomes to build our reference genome to then do the comparison. And then lastly, you obviously need a surrogate uh, that will be able to house the, the genetically modified embryo once you get there. And getting those ancient samples, I guess, does that get harder and harder the further back in evolutionary time that you're working yeah. with? Yeah, well, and also conditions, right? And so there's, there's animals that have gone extinct more recently than mammoths that went extinct in very hot and wet places. That's not a great place for, you know, uh, DNA. Cold, dry places is great. So things like, you know, caves or uh, the Arctic in case of the permafrost. There were some cir circumstances like the thylacine where uh, some of, you know, they went to extinct in 1936, where they actually, uh, you know, people preserved uh, some pups in, um, uh, uh, in ethanol and, and also in alcohol um, uh, for scientific study. And we were able to sequence those uh, uh, to get a nearly complete genome. So it, it really depends. Sometimes you get lucky, but generally speaking, the further back you go, and the hotter, wetter places you were uh, is bad. Okay, great. And just before we move on to the, the dinosaur stuff, um, you mentioned there about uh, species that have gone extinct in like more modern times. So actually, I think that's a really interesting point because your company, a lot of people think of, you know, the really old stuff like the mammoth and the dodo, but you've got plans for kind of supporting conservation projects, right? So all the technologies that we develop on the path to the extinction uh, some of them have tech applications to human healthcare, which we are monetizing, right? We did that last year. We spun out our first computational biology platform. But all the technologies that could add to assisted reproductive technology, the, the assisted reproductive technology suite for conservation groups, for zoos, for animal uh, groups worldwide, we're subsidizing and giving to the world for free. And so those are tools like, you know, better uh, 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 semantics on nuclear transfer uh, 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 techniques, those are, those are things like better computational biology for research. Like we all the data that we built with the, on, on Asian and, and African elephants, we published to science so that people can use those, right? And so a lot of these technologies not only can be used to bring back mammoths, but can help critically endangered species, right? And so, so if we are successful long-term and we even get to uh, technologies like artificial wombs, which are a ways out, well, you'll, it's much more likely that you'll see extinct animals from us before you see the artificial wombs. But once we get to artificial wombs, think about that for like species like the northern white rhino, right? And so where there's only two females left, if we could clone them or create genetically modified 
uh, versions of them with uh, inserting uh, DNA from other spe from from other uh, lines that are now extinct that that don't exist anymore, and you insert that uh, biodiversity, and then you can grow them in a lab, and then work with great rewilding partners, put them back in the wild. Um, that's pretty awesome, and, and that and we think it could be uh, transformative for conservation. So this this like de extinction toolkit, if you will, that we're that we'll you know we're building over time with our species, uh, we want to make available for free to every conservation group out there. It's really cool to think that some of the ideas that underpin Jurassic Park could actually help us keep endangered species alive. What if we brought some back, including really old ones like the dinosaurs? As Susie explained, animal welfare doesn't get any easier when you're dealing with long extinct species. Well, there's all sorts of problems, aren't there? I mean, it, it, the dinosaurs, first of all, the dinosaurs lived for 170 million years on Earth. You know, and that's a really, really, really long time. So. Uh, T-Rex is closer to us in time than it was to Stegosaurus. Um, you know, many dinosaurs were already fossils by the time other ones lived. So you're bringing all these different animals together um, and, and putting them li living alongside each other. Already that's weird. And then you're bringing in, you know, living animals and putting them al alongside. Um, so how do they all interact? They're not, in they're not in a natural environment. But also, what about the things that they eat? So grass hadn't evolved when the dinosaurs were around. So the herbivores weren't eating grass. And grass is, is quite difficult to eat. It has lots of um, bits of almost glass-like material in it, which causes your teeth to wear down really, really, really fast. So things like horses have evolved these very high crown teeth, which wear down over time. Um, dinosaurs didn't have that. They replaced their teeth continuously through their lives. But if they were eating grass, could they have digested grass? Could their teeth replacement rate keep up with being a worn away? Would some of these plants today be poisonous for these dinosaurs where, that lived in a world where flowering plants hadn't even evolved yet? So I think there's, there's a bit of concern over what they'd eat um, and how they'd get on with each other. But of course, you know, what rights would they have today? So would they be treated like living animals? Would we uh, you know, afford them the same rights that living animals have? Or, or because we've invented them or you know, reconstructed them, would they have a kind of different status? So I think there's a bunch of ethical concerns around it as well. I suppose there would be an element of we could open up a new era of dentistry. That could be <laughs> exciting, but maybe more problems than it solves. A difficult sell for modern zoos then, but as Ben told me, we probably don't need to worry about seeing living, breathing T-Rex anytime soon. We get asked the dinosaur question all the time. Uh, people love mammoths, uh, people love dodos, and, and obviously dialysines too, um, but people really do love dinosaurs. We get probably two or three emails a day about dinosaurs. People love dinosaurs. Uh, I don't want to break hearts, but it is not possible to de-extinct a dinosaur. Every so often, You'll see some press or paper that's like, oh, we got some dino DNA. Uh, they, they didn't. Like Ken Lacavara, who's arguably, you know, the number one paleontologist in the world that discovered Trendatus. He's amazing. He's one of our scientific advisors. Uh, he's probably been the closest because he's actually developed a process to demineralize dinosaur bones and get kind of basic fragments of amino acids, right? But, you know, if we just had amino acids for our mammoth project, we would not be working on it because it's not, not possible. So it's not possible to scientifically bring back a, a dinosaur. I do think that the tools over the next 20 years could get to the point that you could start engineering species that had kind of those dinosaur-like traits. But unlike our work with the mammoth, we can't really look at the genome and identify those core genes and de-extinct them. So I don't think it's possible to bring back a dinosaur or de-extinct one. But I do think over time, you could probably engineer dinosaur-like things but I think then you've got to really ask yourself why. Why are you doing it? What's the purpose? How does this help the world? How does this help ecosystems? How does this help humanity? I think you've got to be really thoughtful about that over time. Yeah, I think it's a great movie, but not necessarily useful science. Yeah. Um, I mean, it sounds really cool. So, it, I mean, it, it sounds cool. And, you know, as a sci-fi as a sci-fi nerd myself, um, yeah, it sounds cool. But, you know, what is the true purpose? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so Dino DNA, you mentioned there, that's a great uh, Mr. DNA segment of the movie. And obviously when Michael Crichton wrote this book, it wasn't intended as an instructional manual for cloning animals. Um, but I just thought it might be fun to touch on some of the kind of, as someone who knows animal cloning pretty damn well, some of the most glaring errors they make in the film when they're attempting to do this. Yeah, absolutely. It's a weird fun fact. So George Church, who's my co-founder, and this is really George's vision. I feel like I'm just a steward of George's vision. He's my partner. He's lead geneticist at Harvard. He's incredible. Uh, if you don't know George, just look up George. 
every scientist in the world should follow George because he's just arguably one of the smartest people on the planet. And um, some of George's early work actually was one of the sequences that showed up in Michael Crichton's book. And so I feel like in a weird way, Michael Crichton, if you're still here today, uh, and George would be close friends because, uh, especially with the launch of Colossal, just because there is that alignment, which is pretty cool. That is an amazing fact, I love that. Um, and so if we ignore all of the glaring flaws and you know the very real risk of death when you do these things, what would you most like to see alive if you could clone a dinosaur? Okay, so we are working on dinosaurs. Uh, I don't know if anyone should ever work on dinosaurs uh, or dinosaur-like species, but you know, um, I'm a big, you know, like mammoths are like, you know, probably one of the biggest iconic species of extinction. Um, and so I would lean towards the T-Rex, right? Like once again, I, I'm not encouraging anyone to work on the T-Rex because I think that would be big and scary and terrifying for the world. We, we already have enough existential problems right now. So evading T-Rexes should not be on our on our current list of problems. We need to focus on like, you know, politics and, and climate change. Like let's focus on other problems where we introduce new ones. Over at the Natural History Museum, it seems like the scientific, logistical and safety concerns around bringing dinosaurs back from the dead have actually put Maidment off entirely. Well, firstly, I mean, did you watch the film? I mean, it didn't end well. So <laughs> I, I'm going to say that, you know, maybe, maybe it's not the best idea. <laughs> I, I don't know. But I think uh, if I had to choose one, it's, it's really tricky because I would say Stegosaurus because it's what I work on. At, you know, it's a dinosaur that I know really, really well. But then I'd be out of a job. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know that I'd choose any, to be honest with you. That's a, an unexpected answer, but I like it. Um, and, and then another question I had about the film, and it's not necessarily science, but I just have to ask, because I think it's been burned on the brains of many people since they read the books. Could a velociraptor really open a door? Um, well, actually, uh, the meat-eating dinosaurs, uh, they had their hands facing each other, so their palms together, so they were clappers rather than typers, okay. okay, so their palms couldn't face the floor. Um, so for most meat-eating dinosaurs, they couldn't have rotated their wrist round to open a door. They, their wrists don't work like us. Now, things like Velociraptor and, and animals quite closely related to that actually had the ability to almost fold their, their arms backwards like a wing, um, So because this is where wings evolved from dinosaurs, very similar um, to them. So um, they had this, this bone in their wrist that would have allowed their, their wrist to fold back, but I still am not totally convinced that they could do that to open a door handle. So I think we're safe. There we go. Yeah. All you need to do to beat a Velociraptor is build the door. Mm -hmm. Job done. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've kind of teased at the movie a bit, but I know for me, it's a film that I've watched probably more than anything else in my entire life. What did Jurassic Park mean to you? I was 12 when Jurassic Park came out. Um, I went to see it with my first boyfriend. We held hands in the queue. It was a very special moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think Jurassic Park for me, when I was, because I was a young teenager, it made, um, liking dinosaurs and thinking dinosaurs were interesting and cool, um, a little bit more socially acceptable, which as a girl in the early 90s wasn't always necessarily the case, I think. So I think it, it, um, it made it the, the, the discipline a bit more uh, socially acceptable. And I think also, uh, um, you know, it made dinosaurs really star in people's minds. It made, you know, it brought them to the forefront of people's consciousness. And I think that did a lot for paleontology as a whole, um, because I think that, that increased funding to the discipline. Um, I think it really shone a light on, on dinosaur research. And, and I think that helps all of us in the end. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Susie. That was great. So as far as the science goes, it seems like cloning dinosaurs, probably not that likely. But then what is it they say? Life finds a way. Thanks for listening to IFL Science The Big Questions. Head over to iflscience.com and don't forget to sign up to our newsletter so you don't miss out on the biggest stories each week. Until next time.